Edgar Mueller, right? It's the, with the sort of weird U with the two eyes up top with the two dots. Uh, the thing with Edgar Mueller, he would be known for these very 3D illusory artwork. When you see it now, you just see like, okay, maybe I think it's a rock, maybe that's water. The thing that was unique to him, among with many artists in his craft, is that the way they would do their art, the best way, or rather the only way to really appreciate the art is if you stand in a certain location. You see that area behind him over, over yonder? And if you just see it and you watch him, you know he's painting, you see there's technique to it, but when you stand at a certain spot, what you get is something like this, right? This is a pier off, you know, just sort of facing the water and everything. And if you stand right here in this location, some of you might have vertigo, be afraid of heights, you might be reacting already. But for some people who are just standing here, they don't see what this person standing here sees, right? And for many things, right, including this type of painting, uh, Edgar Mueller would say he would want to challenge people's perceptions of reality. Maybe in one moment, it's a pier, it's a, just an open area you walk to, look at the, the sea beyond. But when you stand at a certain spot, your reality changes. And the thing that was sort of weird beforehand begins to take shape, and you begin to value it. I want to ask you guys just like two questions. Show of hands here, who right now views and considers Jesus as the Lord of their life? Who here sees Jesus as the Lord, the Savior of their life? Can okay, see the hands? Right? You can just be honest about it and hands down. And at the same time, who here among you is currently serving? Who's currently volunteering as a servant to Christ? Currently volunteering, currently serving. A little less hands. Uh, much less, less hands. Much like the artwork of Edgar Mueller. I want to show you this passage in Ephesians 4, verse 11. Can we all read this? And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Now, a lot of us here may be Christians, but I don't think this is a pastor's conference this Sunday morning. Some of you uh, may not even know people who consider themselves as apostles today, or evangelists, or prophets, and everything. So when you see just verse 11, you think to yourself, yeah, I, I don't fit any of these categories. I'm not really serving or volunteering at the moment. But there's another verse after verse 11. It's verse 12. Let's read this. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. What is Paul saying in his letter to the Ephesians in Ephesus? to the Christians in Ephesus, he is laying out this framework, this structure that all these people, whether or not you fit any of these titles or roles, that all these people, these are not the servants. These are not the people who do the ministry per se. These are the people who equip the saints, right? Living Christians. These people equip people like you and me for what? The work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Today, I think a lot of people, we may not say these categories out loud, but for some of us, we might have this either A, either B category of either you're serving Jesus or you're currently, you know, you're not a servant, you're not a servant to Jesus. You're either a servant or not a servant, right? And in your mind, you think, I'm a Christian, but right now I'm not serving and everything. That's not how Paul and the others would talk about Christianity in the Bible. It's not, are you a servant, and then you're not a servant. The truth is, if you are a believer in Jesus, if you are a child of God, if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to say Jesus is your Lord implies you're His servant. So the actual category isn't, I'm a servant, I'm not a servant. There are those today who are serving God well, and there are other servants of God today who have no clue that they're actually, they're actually hired by God. They're actually tasked by God already to be servants to Him. Can everyone say, you're His servant? Can you say it like you mean it? You're His servant. My hope and prayer for this topic today, two weeks ago we talked about the, the first core value of CCF, which is love. Love God, love others. We talked about O, which is obey God's word and authorities. And today we have the not-so-trendy, fun word, volunteer or serve. 
And my hope and prayer with this one session for this very big topic, actually, is that I can help all of us, similar to the artwork of Edgar Mueller, reorient our perspective on what service really is so that we can actually begin to value it the way God values it. The title for today, Ongapala. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, you'll be seeing this QR code. You'll be seeing this bit.ly link a whole bunch today. For those of you who, maybe even before I begin preaching the lesson today, you already feel compelled and led by the Holy Spirit to consider ways to serve. You can scan, you can type. If you're old school, we have, we've printed out forms outside where you can fill out and see the different avenues, within CCF at least, of ways you can help serve today. Okay? And again, this is something that, as we go through the lesson, we'll shed more light on it, but you expect this to pop up a bit. All right? Let's get to the title. Write this down. The title for today is Volunteer, Serve God Joyfully. And before we go any further, let's just pray and dedicate this time to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we just come to you today. And God, maybe in our minds we're still thinking of this past week. Maybe we're thinking of the recent traffic, the recent just things going on, oh God. I pray that with our time together, you would draw our thoughts and our attention to you. That our self-focused actions and activities would now see you in the equation. And I pray that you would speak to people's hearts because I know from the get-go, God, I can't change people's hearts, but you can. And me and many other people have been praying for all those who would hear your word today. So speak, and may we have hearts to listen. In your name we all pray. Amen and amen. Our main passage we'll be camping out today is Romans chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, what I ask of you, because we'll be jumping apart from Romans 12, we'll be jumping in different parts of the Bible today, but I really ask you that you stay in Romans 12 because uh, we'll be going very specific or very sort of granular with a lot of the words there in Romans 12. Quick outline for today, we'll be talking about three M's when it comes to serving God today. The first M is the motive of service. Can everyone say motive? motive. All right, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I'll read it for all, all of us. Paul writes, and there's a lot to unpack here. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, if you've been in CCF long enough, if you've been hearing Romans 12 long enough, you know that therefore is a, a loaded word. As Paul begins to write Romans 12, he is assuming you are fully aware and you have just finished reading chapters 1 to 11. I don't got time to go through 11 chapters beforehand, but I want to go through Titus because as Paul writes to one of his disciples, one of the fellow servants named Titus, we can see a summary of what he's saying in the first half when he says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. What's Paul referring to specifically when he says the mercies of God? We find ourselves now in Titus chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. Prior to verse 4, Titus has been telling, or rather, God, Paul has been reminding Titus to tell the people to obey authorities, to follow God's word, and then he gives a sort of reminder of, the, of their past, so to speak, of the people they used to be. And then we get to verse 4. It reads, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, let's all read this, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The mercies of God, when you look at Romans 12, verse 1, this amazing truth, reality for us is that we could not save ourselves. We were so depraved and lost. And not even the kind of loss where you know you're lost. It's the kind of loss that you have, no, you have no idea that you're even lost to begin with. That's how bad you're lost. Even as far gone as we were, 
it is, we are reminded that Jesus came down to earth, not because we deserved it, not because we earned him, and he, you know, we have the right to be saved, right? Let's not have any inkling of that thought, but it says, according to his mercy. If you need an idea of what mercy is, because you heard it so much in church, but you don't know, how do you define it? Mercy is not receiving what you deserved. If you deserve punishment, they wave it off. You know, they know, everyone else knows that you deserve that punishment, you deserve that negative outcome. We deserved to be separated from God because of our sin. And yet, by the mercies of God, He reached down and rescued us. When you go back to Romans 12, verse 1, it also says to present your bodies. In light of everything Paul has talked about theologically in terms of doctrine and just reminders of truth, he now says action. He now says practical things. We are called to present our bodies as a what? In verse 1 of Romans 12, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. In the time of the Old Testament, what Israel was commanded to do to atone for their sins, to, to cover their sins, is to do animal sacrifice. And God was very specific in particular with the kind of sacrifice, um, not because He's fickle and petty, but because it's also very symbolic and important because what God would tell Israel to do and be mindful of is that the animal they pick, the lamb they would pick to sacrifice has to be unblemished. Or in simpler terms, it has to be spotless and it can't have any um, flaws or defects. But there's a time, not in the old, old books of the Old Testament, but sadly in the latter books, where this practice, where this action of obedience to God was taken for granted. We find this in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, verse, uh, Malachi chapter 1, verse 8. If you read Malachi, if you were here when we went through Malachi a couple months back, I believe, God had a lot to say, not a lot of positive things about what Israel and specifically the priests were doing and were failing to do as well. Uh, God speaks through Malachi and says, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, this is the land, these are the animals, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts. You know how maybe we're sometimes nicer to our friends and our parents or even our siblings, and sometimes we get called out for that. Sometimes I've heard parents say, you know, if I know you wouldn't talk to your friends that way, but to me, you're rude. To me, you talk like this and that. Or maybe the opposite. Maybe you have parents who they talk so kindly to their adult friends and other people they know, but when they're alone with you at home, they're very curt, they're very rude. And God is calling out Israel for this. Even on the, on the outside, it seems they're still obeying Him. They're still presenting these sacrifices. What does God say in verse 10? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. If it's not clear yet, God says, I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. In Romans 12, it says, a living and holy sacrifice. Holy means set apart. Right? In the same way you have your own toothbrush, you have shoes or your own special golf set or whatever that you don't let anyone else touch, we are called to be set apart for God. We're called to be living sacrifices. It's one thing to have this heroic mindset of, you know, honey, or, you know, talk to your boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, I'd catch a grenade for you, Bruno Mars style. I'd jump and catch a bullet for you. And it sounds cool, it sounds very romantic, but... It's one thing to die for someone one time, but God calls us to live and die daily for Him. And some of us rather die once and die, rather than die daily. In Romans 12 verse 1, it also says this sacrifice has to be acceptable to God. The crazy thing today is that some people do serve God, do, do things for God, but it's on their terms. What do I mean? We're all commanded to serve God in different ways, but... 
sometimes we can be very selective about it. Some of us love when God says to serve in the ministry. Oh, I love to use my gifts. I love to do these things for other people. And then when God tells that person, all right, uh, I think also I, I want to I urge you, I want to you know, just compel you to give to someone, give to someone in need. And then we're like, ah, God, I'll just serve you extra in the lung. And we sort of black out that command of God for us. For some of us, God has blessed us to give, and we give, and it's, we, uh, by God's grace, we can do it, and it's not to our own detriment. And then when God tells you to serve, we tell God, I'll just give more. You can serve God just on your terms. Eh? I think God would say the same thing He would say to the Israelites in Malachi, that He is not pleased with us when we try and sort of set the standards or set the parameters on how we want to serve Him. And the last thing in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, all this, this whole picture of action or practical steps we are called to take, Paul says, this is your spiritual service of worship. This is your life as a picture of you just being at the feet of Jesus, laying it all down for your Lord. And when some of us have this mindset of service, Again, we talked about perspective. We talked about you know, 3D artwork, 3D art kanina. That we sometimes hear all these things and we think, wow, God is really asking a lot of us, huh? God is really just wanting you to take, take, take and not give anything. In the last words of Moses to the people of Israel, as he's been laying down the commands of God and laying out what would happen if we don't obey God, Here's how he summarizes it in verse 19. Can we all read this? I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Israel is not yet in a promised land. That's up for Joshua to lead the people there. But Moses is already telling them, hey, if you choose to not obey God, I made very clear what's going to happen. I made very clear what you're not going to experience. Notice how even if they obey God, didn't obey God, it wouldn't directly affect God per se, right? It's up to them if they want to make it to the promised land or not. There. And a lot of Christians today call themselves Christians, and in many cases, I believe you're, you're a genuine Christian, but if someone looked at your life, maybe even, even if you looked at your own life, would you call yourself blessed on the daily? Uh, not just that, you know, I'm grateful God saved me and everything, but just the, I put it this way, because I have this friend who essentially is trying to share and trying to reach out to someone he loves and to have them come to the faith. And he doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know what verse to use. And I just asked him a simple question. I asked him, does this person want the fruits of your life? And maybe for, like, like him, some of you are also wondering what I mean by that. I asked him, does this person, in a, in a good way, are they envious of your joy? Are they jealous that you can go through such hardship and yet you are so at peace? Or do they see fruits in your life that are similar to theirs, even though that person is not a believer yet? I really believe that a lot of Christians are shortchanging themselves with the Christian life because though they have chosen to accept Jesus as their Savior, they're still kind of iffy on Him being their Lord. And even though it's a Christian life, they have yet to choose the path of life. I want to sort of bookend point number one in this way. You can write this down. I'll give you time to write this down. Oh, look, QR code. Anyway. His mercy... God's mercy draws us into His service, bringing His blessings when done His way. If today you are not serving God, if Kanina, you didn't raise your hands when, you, when I asked if you're a volunteer or if you're a servant of God, there could be many reasons for that. I'm not going to be too reductive. But I think for some of us, it might be because we have not even crossed the threshold of the first few words here. We have yet to fully grasp in our hearts, not just our minds, the mercy 
that we have been so graciously given. If you, I've noticed that when someone in the friend group is generous, if out of the blue they say, you know, it's my treat, all of a sudden someone else is also generous, right? I notice that for people who have fully understood and come to terms with the grace and mercy of God, it's just natural that they start serving. Today, if you are serving, why do you serve? Is it for the blessings? Or is it because you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good? You know, the funny thing in my case, um, kahit na, even though I, I have a lot on my plate, uh, don't, you don't need to pity me or anything, uh, there was one point during the pandemic that even though I had an upline D group, a downline D group, and other things going on, uh, long story short, God said, I want you to reach out to this teen, to this preteen, and just spend time with him. Eventually, it became a Bible study. Eventually, it became a group and everything. But I'll be honest, I felt not up to it. I, I had the thought that maybe some of you might have every now and then with God of, aren't I doing a lot already? Aren't I already serving you in some way? And God didn't really re reply to that question of mine. It was almost as if he was saying, just watch, right? You know, I'll, there are even times I was telling this bunch of uh, preteens and teens, some of them now are like taller than me, which, why God? Why is that? Why do you allow that? But I would tell them from the get-go because I tell them, hey guys, you know, uh, whether your videos are on or off, uh, I'm not being paid to do Bible study with you. Some of them, the weird thing is, not all of them are even Christians, and their parents know I'm a Christian, and they're still allowed to go to this Bible study. God has His way of doing things. And I just tell them, like, if you want to be here, be here. And I, if you're here, I'm going to be here for you. And I did, I'm still doing this for a couple of years now. And um, a couple of years back, I got this uh, note. It was like, for my birthday from... Grabe, God, first point pa lang. Okay. Um, uh, this was the... Okay, okay. I have some friends who are excited that I'm crying. Um, I hear them now. He was the first kid I was just spending time with. We'd go to the playground. He'd ask me hard questions about God. Uh, I'll, I'll omit his name because I didn't ask for permission. Um, he just says, uh, Belated happy birthday, uh, Mr. Miles. I prefer Mr. more than Kuya. Um, <laughs> um, uh, it's raining today. Thank you for teaching me and the boys the good news. You have always been like the older brother I never had. Um, you are really, to me, Kuya Miles. Have a good one. Those are the blessings that I think God is talking about. The blessings that really last for eternity. And I was so humbled because this is something I didn't want to do. I didn't think it was even worth doing. And I see why God was silent when I had questions. Maybe for some of you, this is the only thing God wanted you to hear today. And maybe he just, he just wants to tell you that there is a blessing that you have yet to experience, no matter how much he has blessed you in other areas. Dad, please, come on. <laughs> I don't know. If you ever wonder if I'm really Pastor Joby's son, you can just check how much we cry, yeah? <laughs> his mercy draws us into His service, bringing His blessings when done His way. Why do you serve? Let's all breathe. Point number two. We talked about the motive of service. Now we'll, we'll go to the mindset of service. Someone say mindset. mindset. Thank you. Verse two. It reads, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The default state, whenever you read Paul talk about Christians talking about the flesh, walking by the Spirit, there's no middle ground, if you notice. There's no, oh, I'm still praying about serving, I'm still praying about walking by the Spirit. 
But as long, at least I'm not walking by the flesh, the right? But that's not really how Paul in the Bible would talk about it. If we're not being transformed by the reading of our mind in God, by default, we're doing the opposite. You know, even, funny enough, today, even in secular self-help books, uh, for those of you who have ever heard of the book Atomic Habits, right, you might see this illustration there. It's funny because today, a lot of Christians and non-Christians, the way we would go about changing ourselves, right, New Year's resolutions, all that and more, is we would set outcomes or goals. That's our layer of behavior change, very external. I want to lose this many pounds. I want to learn this language. I want to finish the Bible by this time. I want to this and that, right? And statistically, and maybe for you from experience, when your focus is just on the outcomes, it doesn't last too long, does it? And for some of us, we go a layer deeper, right? We go through processes, right? It's not about, you know, uh, reading the Bible or having the goal of reading the Bible within a year. The goal is, or rather, my focus should be, I build this habit and process of always having quiet time in the morning, the goal isn't to run this far, this fast, by this time. The goal is to keep walking, to have this weekly rhythm of exercise, right? And that also helps, but only to a certain point. And what's funny is even secular thought, psychology, marketing, the way they target people, the way they even get you to buy into their products, to their lifestyles, is they don't, they don't target these things anymore, right? They target your identity. They don't say, hey, you should run, it's healthy, it's a hey, you should be a runner. And they sell you, they, buy, they convince you that the lifestyle of being a runner is worthwhile, right? In the same way, when Paul says in verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, notice he doesn't just say, all right, now do better. All right, now take, do these things, this and that. It's almost as if, well, not as if, it's, it's if. It really is the case. That service involves a inside-out change. It's not just something external. We see this even in other letters of Paul in Colossians. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, he writes, and this is similar if you, if you compare this to Romans 12, right? Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Everyone? Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. You might hear this in sports, especially if you've been watching the Olympics and seeing the interviews. This focus on mindset, right? Okay, have this mindset, you're going to win, you train hard for this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what the Bible says we are called to set our minds on are on the things above, right? Where Christ is. And the, the crazy thing is, Paul has to remind people to do this, which means it's not an automatic thing we do, actually. We do the opposite. Though we are Christians, though we love God and we want to serve Jesus and we want to just really be Christians, our minds are still set, our minds are still being conformed to the old ways we used to live in. And that makes it very hard to try to walk the Christian life without this immense guilt that the devil tries to remind you of or bring to your attention. God will call you to do a Bible study and he'll tell you about, remember the time that there was a Bible study in college or in this event and you, you made fun of it? or you were attending a Bible study and you were barely listening, what makes you think you can lead a Bible study now? There will be times that God will call you to do other ministry tasks and all these things, and God will tell you, that's not you. There's no way you can inspire people. There's no way you can be a, uh, an usher or you can encourage people. When we try to serve God with an outdated mindset, we get upset. And that's not really... It's not something that we have to go through. It's something we can actually avoid. We see this even in the Old Testament. In Psalm 16, verses 8 to 9, notice sort of the, the flow here, right? The psalmist writes, I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, everyone, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. A lot of people today pray for peace. Pray for, God, give me just one week where I'm not panicking. Right? And we ask God to give us the, the, that sort of outcome. 
But what did the psalmist do beforehand? Though prayer is good. Prior to all these things happening, prior to the therefore, he's, it says, I have set the Lord continually before me. That means he has begun and he has continued to keep God at the forefront of whatever he's doing, wherever he's looking, whatever he's even thinking. And what's challenging and what's also hard for a lot of us as believers is it's very easy to compartmentalize God in our lives. If we're honest, the times we have quiet time the most, read the Bible the most, is when it's our turn to lead Bible study. The times where we're so deep in prayer and we're just like praying for 10 minutes, 20 minutes is when there's an exam, when there's a big project, there's a big presentation. And the moment that thing is gone, the moment you're done serving, because, oh, it's not Sunday now, you're not serving now, or it's no longer Saturday if you're uh, elevate or a big ministry, that God is, not, is no longer before you, is He? And we wonder why we have this peace, we have this joy during the weekend, and then during the weekdays, we feel lost. We feel shaken. And here's, here's the truth. Here's the thing I want to sort of just say for a lot of us here. When our minds are set on God, our service is unshaken. You know, I really, prior to this message, I was praying for the people who don't consider themselves volunteers yet, and even for those who are volunteers and consider themselves volunteers, yeah? Because it's ironically easy to do so many things for God and to lose sight of God in the process of that. To teach, to sing, to handle all these things that make CCF able to function, and then our quiet time gets compromised because of it. Our intimacy with God takes a back seat to doing things for God. And all the while, our hearts, our lives, our thoughts are shaky. I think if I talked to some of you, and if you were honest with your answers, and I asked you, how are you right now? Serving or not serving? Viewing yourself as a, as a servant or not a servant? If you're honest, you might feel that your life is anything but stable. And stability is not a season in life. God doesn't say, okay, today is, or this month is a wilderness season. This season, it's chill. You don't, need to, you don't even have to pray. It's so chill. You don't need to pray. You don't need to do anything. That's not really how it's laid out, is it? It's even in the fires, in the floods, in the storms, God says there is peace that can be found. There is this steadfastness that is accessible if only we would set him before us. And the question for us, honestly, is what is your mind set on today? Because you can know Jesus, but he is not, he can easily be not what your mind is set on. I want to encourage you, whether you are a volunteer yet or you, you just realize today that you're a volunteer, that there is something so amazing that we get to experience when we set our hearts, our minds on God, that doesn't happen when we just take a back seat in our service to Him. Today we have a, we have a brother who will share his testimony with us. Can we all welcome Brother John? Yeah. I'm happy to tell you about my volunteering experience as an encouragement to everyone. My family and I began attending worship services at CCF Alabang in 2011. It took us about two years before my wife, my wife is here, before my wife and I made the decision to join a discipleship group because we didn't want to make a bigger commitment than simply showing up for Sunday services. In 2016, we attended the True Life Retreat and got to meet a lot of people who up to now have continued to support us and help us to get involved in various church activities. And to be honest, I was hesitant to participate in other events. And I intentionally avoided helping in any church ministries because of a painful experience I had from our previous church. But we were encouraged to commit one, once a month for at least 30 minutes after the service in Manning Discipleship Booth. It seemed to me na 
Malit na bagay lang. So, isa po kami sa nakikita nyo sa labas na sumisigaw ng Join the D Group. That time, uh, that is near na in elevator, no? And we assisted everyone to join, to sign up for D Group. In 2018, I started leading a D Group, but eventually I stopped due to my members' conflict of schedules and other reasons like transferring of residence and workplace. I felt ineffective thinking that leading a D-group was not for me. But in 2022, God entrusted me again with new D-group composed of single and married men. And we are now actively meeting together here in CCF Alabang. Aside from the mentioned activities, my wife and I also volunteered in other special events here in our church. Way back in 2019, I was asked to facilitate the 3 p.m. Tagdish worship service. My main task was to welcome the attendees, make the announcements, and invite everyone to upcoming events. Unfortunately, the pandemic came and we were focused to worship online. But when the live worship services in Alabang resumed, I was assigned to, task, to that task again up until now. I was also tapped to minister in wake services. It is common to minister to bereaved family if we know them personally. But this year, I was approached to minister twice to families who I, I didn't personally know. But praise God, it went well. From 2019 up to present, my wife and I had several experiences in being facilitators of retreats, namely couples and through life. Our recent uh, facilitating task, which started just this August, is with the Bureau of Corrections officers using our GLC-1 course. Volunteering is not an easy task. It demands time and effort and a lot of prayer. It is coming out of our comfort zone, and sometimes there are disappointments. As a volunteer, God taught me to depend on Him alone and not on my own knowledge and skill. I realize that Jesus came to serve and not to be served. Through serving, I came to understand that it is a privilege to represent Jesus Christ to the world and a commitment to give my best to the Lord wholeheartedly. Sharing my spiritual gifts and abilities gave me a purpose in my everyday life as I experienced exceeding joy in volunteering. Despite discouragements, difficulties, and even frustrations over my shortcomings. I am humbled by the thought that I can share the gospel to people in whatever situation that is being presented to me, like bridging events in areas where I don't know the people, to giving devotions to strengthen fellow volunteer facilitators before an event. For me, Loving God and others is my focus in serving. As it is written, written in Mark chapter 20, verse 30, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. As I end, I would like to thank God and the people He has sent my way to encourage and support me. Their prayers for me and my wife in every volunteering task that we do inside or outside the church, church means a lot. I am John Sing Singwa, a servant of God, saying, Ang maglingkod sa Diyos ay dakila, katapatan sa Kanya ay may pagpapala. God bless us all. Thank you so much, Brother John. Can we pray for you? Let's pray, everyone. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just pray for Brother John here. God, I thank you for the heart you've given him for serving you. God, I, just continue, I pray that you continue to bless him and his uh, wife and his family. And I just ask, oh God, that even in the small tasks, even in the moments where um, he is serving, he is just 
seeking to obey you, God, that you continue to show yourself faithful in his life. And I also pray, God, that you protect him from the attacks of the evil one. May you guard and watch over him. And may you continue to use him mightily, O oh God, to display your power in his life. We pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, brother. When our minds are set on God, our service is unshaken. We now go to the last point, and I'm wondering if some people guessed the last M. We had the motive of service, the mindset of service, and can we all say this? The means of service. We're going to go now to the last handful of verses in Romans chapter 12. We'll go up until verse 8. Do not fret. Verse 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. In the next few verses, Paul will describe spiritual gifts. If you've heard of them, if they sort of spook you, if you're not sure how to make sense of them, in short, for now, spiritual gifts are gracious gifts given to us through the Holy Spirit for the purpose of building up the church, okay? We now go to verse 4 and 5. Verse 4, for just as we have many members, someone say many members, in one body. Someone say one body. And all the members do not have the same function, right? Your hands don't look like your feet, I hope. So we, verse 5, who are many, are one body in Christ. Someone say in Christ. And individually members one of another. Notice how with the past two points, with the motive, with the mindset, it's very much us being mindful, I guess pun intended, to be oriented towards God, right? In light of God's mercies, that's our motive to serve. As I set my mind on God, as I set Him before me, I'm able to not be shaken in this life as I serve Him. And now notice how it sort of pivots a bit. It sort of shifts now to the people around us. If you've ever heard me speak on a Sunday before, you know how much I am adamant about just the community that we ought to have as the body of Christ, right? Despite our uniqueness, despite our diversity, despite the gift, different gifts God has given us, we are called to be one body in Christ right? If today, we'll get to the next few verses in a bit, if today, out of the blue, your hand, your left arm started moving without you thinking or wanting it to move, right? Your hand just attacked you, and you, you're, you can't even, like, use your brain waves to stop it to move. You don't think to yourself, okay, it's, it's another day, right? You're going to panic. You're going to call all your doctor friends for a, for a quick diagnosis and everything. And yet, the church today can act like that sometimes, Yes, we know we're one body, but we have our own agenda. We have our own things we want to do and everything, and we don't think it's weird that the body is dysfunctional for some reason. If it's a human body, we panic. If it's the church, we try to, make, we try to rationalize it if we're not careful. Verse 6 oh, and up to 8, Paul says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, you see this all the more if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes that the Holy Spirit, when we accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit dwells within us, as the Holy Spirit sees fit, He distributes and gives us different gifts. Some of us get flashier gifts. Some of us get, get gifts that are not so outstanding, but very, very needed today. He goes on to say, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And if you go through 1 Corinthians in your spare time, if you go through even 1 Peter, both Paul and Peter write about these spiritual gifts that are not given to us as a badge of esteem, a badge of, look at my rank, this is my gift, you got that gift, sad for you. These gifts are designed and they're purposed for other believers, right? If you ever thought to yourself, I don't know how I can actually add to other people's lives, 
I don't know how I can actually contribute meaningfully to other people. I'm always on the receiving end. I'm always in need. I always have questions. I'm always the one that's a burden. I don't know what words you use to describe yourself. I hope it's not a burden all the time. All that to say, we still sometimes feel unqualified and no hope of being qualified to ever make an impact for God, to ever help other people in a genuine way. But notice how no matter who you were before you came to the faith, the Holy Spirit intentionally gave you something to do, gave you a gift that you can wield for that purpose of serving other people. And if, you ever, if you've ever give, sorry, grammar, too much crying. If you've ever given a gift to someone, and then the next week or the next time you see them, you ask them, oh, how's the gift I gave you? Like the treadmill or the whatever dumbbell or whatever thing you gave, you gave them. And then you go to their house and you see it hasn't even been opened yet. They're like, oh, thanks for the, the treadmill. Like they don't want to even like appreciate or even use it. You might think to yourself, first you might get mad, but you also think to yourself, Sayang naman, it was for their good. It was for their benefit, for other people's benefit. And there's so many things we can talk about when it comes to the spiritual gifts, when it comes to even just, not even just the spiritual things, even the things that God has given you and blessed you with prior to even you being a Christian, right? I want to I highlight, I guess, Philippians for today. As Paul writes about his imprisonment, as he's in prison, he has this very countercultural view of his circumstance. He says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. I think if I was in his shoes, I won't speak on your behalf. If I was Paul, I would initially be really, really, really mad at God. I have been faithful. I have been obeying you. I, I should be out of this prison by now. I should even be thrown into this prison to begin with. But not just even when it comes to the spiritual gifts Paul has, even to the not-so-good things that we wouldn't label as gifts or blessings from God, Paul is able to see those things in light of God, in light of other people, how it's honoring God, glorifying God, and how people are being blessed by it. I think for a lot of us, for those of you people who, for those of us who struggle with people-pleasing tendencies, we're always the one who have to take the high road. We're the ones who have to say sorry first, even though it's their fault. The list can go on, right? It can get tiring. It can get very discouraging to feel as though we're always being poured out, we're always being drained, so that other people can, be, can benefit from it. And in Paul's case, that's not how he sees it. He knows that what he's doing is not just to please people. He's doing it to please God, which benefits other people. But he's doing it just for the audience of one. And as he's doing it, even in the darkest, even in literally the most restricting places you could be in this world, Paul is speaking as though he has the most freedom out of all of us. You know, when we, when we talk about service, again, I don't know where you're at when it comes to your perspective about it, if it's still laborious, if it's still tedious, if it's still disruptive of the plans you have for your life, right? Your two-year, five-year, ten-year plan doesn't mention anything about setting time aside for God because it's going to interrupt a lot of things that you want to do, right? And for some of you also, it's maybe you do want to serve God, but you really, really don't think you're cut out for it. You look at what God has given you, you look at what's in your pockets and what's not in your pockets, so to speak, and you take it for granted. Don't take for granted what God has granted. When there was a large crowd need, needing of food, all they gave Jesus was some bread, some fish, and that was enough. When a widow was at 
her wits end and she was about to lose her kids. And Elijah and Elisha at different times with different widows asked them, what do you have? And they would take it for granted. I just have a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour. And that was enough. What God has given you, what God is calling you to do, even if you think I am the most mismatched person for what you're telling me to do, God, He will make it enough if you don't take for granted what He has granted you. For those of you who, who knew me when I was also like a preteen, like 11 or 12, there's a good chance that you didn't even know my, how I sounded, like my voice, because I was that quiet of a kid. And if you had the misfortune of hearing me speak, it would be very murmuring full of stuttering and stammering and not a lot of eye contact. And then one day God said, I need you to do a Bible study. I need you to do another Bible study. I need you to speak. I need you to speak to more people. And I kept, I kept feeling like Moses. I'm like, God, you're picking the wrong person over and over again. And God said, do you think I picked you because you fit the job? Or do you not realize that I picked you because I know you will say yes? There are people today who are serving a lot more, who are doing a lot, and it's, it's a lot. <laughs> I say a lot, a lot. And it's because maybe for a lot of us other Christians, we keep saying no to God. And God is saying, all right, I have to ask the other person who will say yes. Even though this person has exactly the gifts, the history, the whatever for this, they won't say yes to me. I want to bless them. There was a point when I was still in college that uh, God said, do a Bible study. And I'm like, with who? He said, with your dance org in, in, in college. And I did that for, I think, two years. There will be days that one person would go, two people. I think once there was like nine people. There were many days that no one showed up. Those were the days that I prepared more for the Bible study than for my exam. And I'm like, God, as I'm sitting in this spiral stairway, right, this wide spiral stairway, I'm like, God, I don't want to do this. It's not working out. Why, am I, why are you telling me to do this? And I thought, okay, maybe in my senior year, God will do something with it. And when I graduated and I tried to pass the baton to someone else to lead after I graduated, the baton, speaking of Olympics, um, it was dropped, right? Uh, it didn't continue afterwards. And I was like, God, I didn't want to do that for, at all. I just knew you wanted me to, and it didn't turn out how I imagined it, right? Why? Classic God, when the time is right, He was quiet. Now, as I serve in the youth ministry alongside many other gifted and inspiring people, there are times that there are these disciplers, these young disciplers who would talk to me. You know, we would step aside and they would, they would share things about, they would also prepare their Bible study, prepare the lesson. They'd be so excited and then no one shows up or everyone cancels last minute. And I remember the first time someone asked me uh, when they were sharing these things, Kuya Miles, can you relate to that? Has it ever happened to you? And then in that moment, I realized as small as it might seem, why God allowed me to experience so much, so much disappointment in my college years when it, came, when it came to Bible study, it was so that I could help someone else when maybe in their case, that disappointment would have taken them out. It would have disheartened them to the point of no return, maybe. Whatever God has given you, the good, the really bad, if you just say to God, it's all yours. I'm all yours. Life is, a, is, a, is full of surprising moments where God shows you He really works all things for good. It's not just a verse in Romans 8.28 anymore. It's a reality. What has God given you that you overlook today? Really. Think of the things Maybe in the same way that the, 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 the father of David, Jesse, 
when he was asked to show his sons to Samuel, he didn't mention David. And a person he overlooked became king eventually. What has God given you that you overlooked today? At one point, when the apostles of Jesus were arguing, when they were arguing who was the greatest, who could be second in command in heaven, in the right hand of, of God, of Jesus, Jesus calls them out on that. He says, that's not how we do things here. The Gentiles want to be in authority. If you want to be the greatest, you ought to be a servant. And then he says, as we wrap things up, in Mark 10, 45, let's all read this. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The motive for Jesus for coming down to earth was not, all right, worship me. All right, cater to my every whim. On his last night, the night he knew that the next day he would be crucified, what did Jesus do with, this, with the remaining time he had before his death? He washed the feet of his apostles. He served. When it came to his mindset, he would tell God in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. And that gave him the, the peace, that gave him the resolve to see his crucifixion to the end. When it came to the means, nothing was beneath Jesus. Nothing was beneath him in terms of serving other people. He didn't just want to do the things that were fancy, the things that would get applause, but even the things that were of seemingly no consequence, we still talk about today. For those of you who are still in this place, where service in your mind is just chalk on the ground, and it's not yet this, I really want to speak to you because from experience, it's, it's going to sound crazy because you might think this is a recruitment message. God really doesn't need us. At one point when the followers, like more than just the apostles, when the followers of Jesus were praising Him, worshiping Him, the Pharisees were telling Jesus, tell them to be quiet. Tell them to stop worshiping you. And something I, I thought as a kid was cool, but the older I get, the more almost insulting it sounds. Jesus was telling them, if they stop worshiping me right now, the rocks will worship me. You know how sad it is that you can be replaced by stone, right? No matter how gifted you are, no matter how much you think you deserve or have earned your place in God, uh, to follow God, to serve God, Jesus tells them, you know, if you don't do, if you don't serve me, creation will. Serving God is not something that God needs. It's something He wants for you. And I really pray that as we close, that this is not a foreign thought, that you don't struggle to view yourself as His servant. Even if you've never formally volunteered, you've formally done something that is churchy, something that is ministry-related, if, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you are a child of God which means you also are a servant of the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm not trying to employ you. I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to hire you to volunteer. I just want to let you know that we're all in the same boat. And God is calling us to walk on water. Let's pray. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Heavenly Father, as we just close this time together, as we reflect on what it really means to serve you, God, I pray for everyone here who, maybe because of baggage in the past, the idea of serving you is not appealing. We don't see the value in it, God. I simply pray that you would refresh our hearts and minds of the mercy you've extended to us through Jesus Christ. I pray that you would remind us, God, that there is something we get to be blessed by firsthand when we choose to say yes to your calling. 
And I pray, God, we would just have our hearts and minds set on you. And for those of you here who maybe you've heard of Jesus, but you don't know him personally in that way, what we have said today is true for you as well. That while we were all yet sinners, Christ died for you and me. Yes, even you. Yes, even me. And if you desire to surrender your life and to make him the Savior and Lord alone of your life, pray along with me. You don't have to say and repeat the words, but may your heart have this heart of surrender. God, I'm a sinner, and I couldn't save myself of my sin. In your mercy, you saved us, even us. Thank you, God. Help me to learn what it means to know you and to walk with you. And as I grow to abide in you, to cling to you, may you just guide me in the ways that I ought to serve you. I thank you in advance, oh, oh God. We pray all these things in your mighty, powerful, majestic name. And all of God's people say, amen and amen. God bless you all.